Hello, and welcome to um, the glaucoma lecture series. Today's topic is going to be congenital glaucoma and glaucoma syndromes. Um, congenital glaucoma in and in itself is a very important topic for those of you who are interested in glaucoma um, or those of you uh, who practice general ophthalmology or any or any in either situation, uh, it's important for you to recognize this entity of congenital glaucoma uh, as uh, the the incidence of blindness is very high if the diagnosis is missed. It's high um, even when you diagnose it appropriately, uh, but it's going to be devastating to the patient and the family, um, especially if uh, the diagnosis is missed. And of course, glaucoma syndromes i.e. Um, syndromes, systemic syndromes associated with glaucoma is high on your list of um, exams. Um, and so I thought I'll put together a talk between the two of them. Um, this is Dr. Ramesh Ayala uh, from Tulane School of Medicine, New Orleans, Louisiana. And this talk is presented by Meditred, a leader in online training and medical education. Now, uh, this talk would be incomplete um, um, if we don't recognize uh, the person who um, uh, really explained a lot of things in relation to many of these disorders that we're going to talk today. Otto Barkin, uh, who practiced in Stanford University uh, in San Francisco, he was instrumental in um, uh, in advocating and uh, in teaching us two techniques that are extremely relevant um, and important from the glaucoma point of view. One, gonioscopy, based on which he, we are able to classify glaucoma into um, open angle and uh, closed angle, and goniotomy, which is the most common um, surgical technique um, employed to cure or treat primary congenital glaucoma. Uh, two techniques that he described in uh, or in uh, May, in uh, 1950s, 1940s, and 1950s that we still use. Um, and uh, he's a great guy of uh, Hungarian uh, origin, um, studied in um, Europe, um, and uh, practiced in Stanford. Had a great career. Um, and we need to salute this man uh, for our understanding of uh, glaucoma, both congenital and narrow angle. So let's start off with congenital glaucoma. Here is a patient of mine um, who, uh, this is day three after birth, and this is how she was born. And she was referred to me from um, the pediatrician's office. Um, and this is typically how uh, congenital glaucoma at birth appear. And they have corneal edema because of which um, uh, the eye appears to be blue. Um, uh, and, and of course, the edema is secondary to elevated intraocular pressure. Um, so congenital glaucoma um, is present at birth, primary congenital glaucoma that is. Primary infantile glaucoma can appear in the first few years of life. In both cases, there is an absence of systemic problems, uh, i.e. the glaucoma is strictly related to angle abnormalities. Secondary infantile glaucoma, on the other hand, is associated with uh, uh, inflammatory neoplastic hematomatous metabolic other, or other congenital abnormalities. So we are classifying glaucoma into primary and secondary. Primary congenital glaucoma is related to um, whether it's at birth, in which case you call it as primary congenital glaucoma, or primary infantile glaucoma in the first few years of life. So primary, um, um, primary glaucoma, uh, congenital glaucoma uh, incidence is approximately one in 10,000. Um, it's much less common than primary adult open angle glaucoma. Um, uh, but approximately 2 to 15% of these patients will end up being blind, um, unfortunately. Uh, so it's a pretty devastating disease process um, afflicting this uh, patient population and also uh, 
uh, the entire family gets affected because of this. It's bilateral in about 60 to 80% of the patients, as you can see in this uh, uh, picture. Uh, uh, another patient of mine um, brought to us um, at the age of three months, even though the, the mom noticed uh, that the patient's eye were turning blue uh, from the first one, one month after birth. More common in males, 65% versus 35% male-female ratio. Um, in most cases of, remember, primary congenital glaucoma occur in a sporadic, a sporadic ma manner. Um, and again, I point out, typically a lot of these patients have this blue appearance to the eye simply because of edema, corneal edema related to elevated intraocular pressure. Um, pretty classic when you see this. Now, um, there are other ways of classifying this. Um, one, um, one of the descriptions that you frequently find in relation to cellular glaucoma is bophthalmus, uh, which is enlarged eye or ox eye. Um, uh, it's related to, again, elevated intraocular pressure before the age of three years. Um, the sclera uh, is uh, still elastic before the age of three, and consequently, the, the glow can enlarge. And um, as is seen in this particular patient uh, with uh, in, uh, monocular glaucoma, which was congenital, um, and uh, this baby was born with a unilateral glaucoma in this eye. Um, and you can see that the eyeball is very prominent um, and uh, has a ophthalmic appearance to it. Um, in, in relation to diagnosis, 60% are diagnosed by age. Um, uh, whereas uh, uh, more recently, um, congenital glaucoma uh, has been recognized as a autosomal recessive disorder in certain families um, and is localized to cytochrome P1B1 gene. Uh, the, this cytochrome P1B1 gene has been recognized in several families with congenital glaucoma in uh, uh, throughout the world, in fact, I mean, a lot of uh, research has gone in in the last 10 years and they recognized this gene to be the, um, the prime cause um, uh, in, in a variety of family settings in uh, different continents and countries. So from the exam point of view, remember, um, it's a autosomal recessive um, uh, nature in uh, in a small section of the population, a small section of the uh, of the uh, of the patients, and it's localized to CYP1B1 gene. Now, in relation to pathophysiology, um, when Barkin described uh, Otto Barkin described congenital glaucoma, the the feeling was that there is a membrane that's left behind covering the trabecular meshwork and the idea of goniotomy was to cut this membrane following which um, the pathway, aqueous pathway to the Schlem's canal opens up. And so um, uh, the study of a Barkin membrane covering the trabecular meshwork has become popular. Um, now it is uh, believed that uh, the true Barkin's membrane does not exist and the primary congenital glaucoma is probably secondary to developmental arrest of anterior chamber tissue derived from neural crust cells. Um, this uh, Barkin's membrane as such has never been identified. Here are some uh, examples, gonio picture examples of congenital glaucoma patients of mine. As you can see, usually they have this lacy appearance to the trabecular meshwork where iris um, uh, strands um, are prominently visible in the angle, um, the iris itself appears to be more anteriorly inserted along with the anti-insertion of the ciliary body. Um, and as I mentioned just before, um, it represents a developmental arrest in the late embryonic period.
So classically, patients with congenital glaucoma, either they're born with glaucoma at birth, in which case you can see because of the elevated intraocular pressure, the blue um, uh, cornea, secondary to corneal edema that I showed pictures of in the previous slides, or in the first one year of life, the ma mother may notice that the child has uh, the classic triad of epiphora, i.e. tearing, photophobia, intolerance to bright light and blepharospasm. Uh, squinting the uh, the eye, um, all three of them are secondary to corneal edema. Remember, and this corneal edema is secondary to elevated intraocular pressure. So, uh, increased IOP leads to corneal edema. Corneal edema uh, will give rise to increased sensitivity to light, which in turn will give you this uh, triad of epiphora, photophobia, and blepharospasm. Here is a patient of mine, and if you look closely. Um, you can see the tearing, um, uh, and you can see that the patient is avoiding light. Um, pretty classic, and sometimes the mother um, describes that the, the child would bury uh, his head um, to avoid the light. So typically, patients with childhood glaucoma have a cornea diameter greater than 12 millimeters of mercury. Remember, normal cornea at birth is between 9.5 to 10.5 millimeters. Remember, 10 millimeters on average is the normal corneal diameter at birth. So anything um, greater than 12 millimeters of uh, 12 millimeters um, uh, in diameter should be viewed suspiciously. Corneal edema, as I mentioned, because of increase in uh, intraocular pressure, um, will give you that blue, bluish uh, color, discoloration of the eye, and uh, that. To the limbus, as is visible in this particular patient here, um, you can see that the the striations. Um, these, uh, these striations are uh, running um, horizontally. Um, now this is in contrast to, to so the half striae run like this, right? Okay, this is in contrast to um, decimate tears that happen in a traumatic fashion because of forceps injury, um, uh, and those are vertical in nature. So the half striae from congenital glaucoma, these are um, uh, horizontal or concentric to the limbus, whereas the uh, traumatic um, decimate tears are vertical and related to usually forceps uh, delivery. Um, um, and again, as I mentioned previously, uh, it's secondary to developmental anomaly of the angle structures. Now remember, um, cornea diameter of greater than 3, 13 millimeters at any age or between 12 and 12.5 millimeters below the age of one year is highly suggestive of congenital glaucoma. So um, one of the things that you want to do when you examine these patients is to measure the corneal diameter. Um, both for diagnostic purposes and as you follow these patients, you want, uh, if the glaucoma is poorly controlled, the corneal diameter may keep increasing in the first couple of years. In response to increasing intraocular pressure, remember corneal diameter increases till three years of age, um, after which uh, cornea um, will not increase in diameter, while the sclera can deform till 10 years of age, and that's the reason why um, a, if you do not control the glaucoma in this patient population, they can develop progressive myopia and astigmatism. Um, uh. Now, bophthalmos again is seen in, if you have congenital glaucoma that is untreated in the first three years of life, right? Uh, whereas, as you follow these uh, older kids, um, you can see one way of uh, checking to see if these patients um, have continued glaucoma or not, or if the glaucoma is adequately controlled or not, is to refract them. Uh, progressive myopia and astigmatism uh, would or might indicate that the intraocular pressure is not adequately controlled. Childhood glaucoma, elevated intraocular pressure, is best measured under topical anesthesia, okay? Uh, anything else, uh, the intraocular pressure could be um, altered. 
Um, remember, the normal intraocular pressure of premature babies is approximately 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, between the age of zero to one uh, would be 11, and by the time the child reaches 13 years of age, intraocular pressure, uh, average intraocular pressure normally is uh, is 13.9 millimeters of mercury plus or minus three. Um, uh, so in patients with congenital glaucoma, typically the intraocular pressure is between uh, 30 and 40 millimeters of mercury, okay? 30 and 40 millimeters of mercury in patients with congenital glaucoma. Um, so how do you measure this intraocular pressure? If you can um, insert the topical anesthetic drops and then while the baby is uh, feeding uh, or sleeping quickly, use a tonopin and check the intraocular pressure, that probably would be the best way. Um, if you have to do the intraocular pressure measurement under sedation, remember almost all general anesthetic agents and sedatives would lower the intraocular pressure, except for ketamine, would, uh, which would increase intraocular pressure. Um, this is an important point for you to remember. Um, and so typically, when you schedule these ba babies for examination under general anesthesia, um, as soon as the baby is lightly sedated, the first thing you want to do is to check the intraocular pressure. So keep your, get your tonopin or the Perkins ready for that purpose. Um, uh, another important feature of childhood glaucoma is the optic nerve cupping. Congenital glaucoma patients, um, when you examine their optic nerves, so they exhibit the symmetric cupping with generalized enlargement. Um, uh, and that's in... Uh, uh, response to the elevated intraocular pressure. Uh, now, the, the important thing about this is if you do control the intraocular pressure, immediately um, this cupping is reversible. Um, and poor control of the intraocular pressure um, would also present as increasing myopia with astigmatism that I like, as I previously mentioned. And this is because of increasing size of the, of the eye itself as the sclera does not um, uh, lose its elasticity till almost the age of 10. So the differential diagnosis for a baby who presents with congenital glaucoma would include uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction, in which case you can see a mucopurulent discharge apart from the triad, classic triad, that we just described, uveitis and corneal injury. All three of these uh, diagnostic, um, all three of these uh, di um, uh, disease processes can present with um, epiphora, um, uh, photophobia, and blepharospasm. It's not um, difficult for you to, uh, to discern this uh, differential diagnosis as a close um, clinical examination should be able to um, um, find the actual diagnosis. Now, patients uh, sometimes can present corneal opacities, as is seen in storage disorders and Peters anomaly and sclerocornea, and that could pose a congenital, uh, pose a diagnostic dilemma. And in these patients, obviously, you want to examine the, uh, under anesthesia and uh, check the intraocular pressure um, and, if possible, the optic nerve fundus examination to come to a conclusion as to if the patient has glaucoma or not. Megalocornea, again, a congenital abnormality where the cornea is enlarged, um, is another differential um, that can present as, a, um, uh, as an enlarged um, uh, cornea um, uh, that can present as a differential for congenital glaucoma. Obviously, in these patients with megalocornea, the intraocular pressure is normal, optic nerve appearance appears to be normal, and the structure of the cornea uh, itself clearly delineates uh, the, uh, the diagnosis. So as I mentioned, the, the way we make the conclusive diagnosis in the majority of these patients is to uh, sedate the patient and, uh, and uh, check the intraocular pressure uh, where possible, do cornioscopy um, and fundus examination of the optic nerve head. And you also, uh, if the cornea is clear enough, you want to do a, a refraction. Um, so the things that you want to do when you sedate these babies or examine them under anesthesia is um, A, check the intraocular pressure, B, gonioscopy, 3, C, uh, fundus examination, um, and document the findings. And then, of course, you want to do a refraction um, and document that too. Um, now, remember, as I mentioned previously, most sedatives and um, general anesthetic agents will lower the intraocular pressure, except for ketamine, which may increase intraocular pressure. 
So the best way to do this is as soon as the baby is mildly sedated, check the intraocular pressure to get the best readings possible. Normal intraocular pressure under general anesthesia in a baby who does not have glaucoma is between 10 and 20 millimeters of mercury. Um, um, now in about 25 to 30 percent of the patients, the elevated intraocular pressure is um, restricted to only one eye, meaning that the glaucoma could be unilateral. Um, how do we treat these patients with uh, childhood glaucoma? Once you make a diagnosis, um, you can try medications, myotics, um, beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, or the mainstay. Remember, myotics generally not or not effective in controlling intraocular pressure, but are useful prior to goniotomy, so as to constrict the pupil and open up the angle structures um, for better visualization and also to perform the, the procedure of goniotomy. Acetazolamide or diamide. 15 milligrams per kg body weight um, uh, per day divided uh, over every six to eight hours. Um, usually well tolerated um, by these babies. A uh, few side effects uh, include diarrhea and weakness. Um, um, Timolol is another drug, 0.25% twice a day, one drop is very effective in up to 70% of the patients, and 5% of the patients can exhibit some side effects, including asthma, bradycardia, et cetera. So all these medications can have some side effects, but having said that, majority of the patients, um, um, the intraocular pressure could be controlled, a combination. Adrenergic agonists, which have such as um, uh, bromonidine um, and uh, apraclonidine, which have serious effects in um, using seizures um, and apnea. So remember, from the medications point of view, the two mainstays um, are one, oral acetazolamide, and uh, two, topical timolol or beta blocker. Now, most of the side effects that have been reported with the beta blocker, i.e. timolol, is with 0.5% and not 0.25%. So you would like to prefer to prefer prescribe 0.25% in uh, pediatric population. Now, remember, glaucoma is a surgical disease. Um, uh, uh, congenital glaucoma is a surgical disease and uh, the treatment, uh, if the cornea is clear, is goniotomy. If the cornea is not clear, um, as is seen in this particular example, uh, obviously there's no view of the angle structures and so you cannot do goniotomy, in which case you can do either a trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, or a combination of both, or if the, uh, if the angle is, um, um, is completely um, uh, um, uh, disorganized, and then you may want to treat uh, uh, with the glaucoma drainage device implantation. <clears throat> um, so here is a uh, patient um, with congenital glaucoma that presented to our clinic. As you can see, the blue sclera, uh, the, sorry, the blue cornea, i.e. the uh, corneal edema in both eyes, there's no angle uh, structures visible. Um, typically, the way I handle these patients where the visibility to the angle structures is not clear uh, with an opaque cornea, uh, we do an ultrasound examination of these eyes in the, in, under anesthesia. Um, these high-frequency ultrasound machines are pretty useful to delineate the angle structures. Um, um, if the angle is, uh, is, is, um, is, uh, appears to be normal um, in, uh, on ultrasound examination, I prefer to do um, either a ab, ab, ab external um, 360 degree uh, trabeculotomy in combination with trabeculectomy um, or if the patient's angle is abnormal with multiple iris processes attached to the cornea and the iris, et cetera, you may want to lower the intraocular pressure by inserting a glaucoma drainage device, such as a pediatric amid valve in these patients. Um, here is an example of a patient where we did the, we are, here is the canal, um, as you can see, and here is the microcatheter that I'm threading through the canal um, in this particular patient, and within um, uh, one week, you can see how nicely the cornea appears to be clearing up. And uh, this particular patient ended up with uh, um, pretty decent vision. Um, 
So again, um, to stress the importance of this, um, uh, please note that uh, cellular glaucoma is a devastating disease. Um, please uh, re, uh, understand the concepts of uh, cellular glaucoma so you can make the appropriate diagnosis when you see these patients and uh, take the time to discuss the findings with the parents uh, because uh, the, the parents have to be on board with you. Uh, this is a lifelong treatment uh, that you're going to offer to these patients. Just simply doing uh, uh, the curative uh, treatment at the time is not sufficient. Uh, majority of these patients will develop some degree of amblyopia. Um, you have to work in conjunction with your pediatric ophthalmologist um, to treat the amblyopia um, after the intraocular pressure is better controlled. So it's a team effort that is needed. Um, you have to work with the parents, with the pediatric ophthalmologist, and some of these patients with associated systemic diseases that we're going to discuss um, in the next few slides, you will have to work with the uh, pediatrician and a pediatric neurologist as well. In conclusion, uh, congenital glaucoma, when treated, is a very rewarding um, uh, 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 disease process in the sense that you are able to restore some degree of vision to this uh, patient population. And some of them um, grow up to be very intelligent, uh, productive young people. Let's move on to glaucoma syndromes. Um, and this is high yield um, from your exam's point of view, even though you may not see uh, any or many of them in your lifetime. Um, mesodermal dysgenesis of cornea and the iris. Um, it's classified into three categories, the posterior embryo toxin, which is a prominent and anteriorly displaced Schwalbe's ring, um, which is clinically visible, um, Axenfield's syndrome, which is uh, a combination of posterior embryo toxin plus iris processes to the Schwalbe's ring, and Rieger syndrome, which is a combination of posterior embryo toxin um, in association with iris processes, Schwalbe's ring, and iris hypoplasia. Um, and even though it's been described as uh, three distinct entities, now it's recognized that this is just a continuum of the same disease process. Mild, um, the milder version of this would be the posterior embryo toxin, and the more severe version would be the Rieger syndrome. Peter's anomaly or Peter's syndrome is um, uh, associated with angle malformation with central iris, corneal adhesions, and opaque cornea. This is the key for Peter's. Peter's is associated with iris, corneal adhesions, and opaque cornea. Um, Here is a patient, um, the picture that you see has Peter's anomaly um, on the right side and uh, congenital glaucoma on the left side. So the axenfield Rieger syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder. Um, approximately 50% will go on to develop glaucoma. Uh, it results from neural cross derived tissue abnormalities. Um, here in this picture, you can see uh, the posterior embryo toxin uh, which is very clearly visible um, along the limbus. And here is a patient of mine with the posterior, with the axenfield Rieger syndrome. And you can clearly see um, the polychoria, uh, keratopia, um, and iris atrophy in this particular patient that I ended up treating with the tube. Uh, To, so to sum up, uh, axenfield Rieger syndrome is autosomal dominant. It's associated with posterior embryo toxin, iris bands to the Schwalbe's line, iris hypoplasia, polychoria, dental anomalies, maxillary hypoplasia, protruding lower lip, flat nose, and wide interorbital distance. Unilateral, most commonly unilateral disorder that is seen in adults between 20 and 40 years of age um, can be classified into Chandler syndrome, wherein the corneal endothelial dystrophy is associated with corneal edema and iris atrophy with peripheral cynical adhesions. Um, 
or the Cogan Reese syndrome um, um, uh, or the iris nevus syndrome is associated with nodular pigmented iris lesions, um, iris atrophy, um, peripheral anterior cynical adhesions, and ectropia on UVA, as is seen in this um, uh, picture here. And progressive iris atrophy. Um, which is associated with corneal endothelial dystrophy, iris atrophy, keratopia, PAS, or peripheral anterocynical formation, and, and atrophy on UVA. Um, the primary pathology in all three of these diseases, as I mentioned previously in my previous lectures, is an abnormal corneal endothelium that uh, spreads across the angle into on, onto the surface of the iris, um, and contraction of this membrane um, would give rise to the PS formation of purple cynical adhesions, closing the angle, giving rise to glaucoma. Um, at the same time, it can choke the iris um, tissue to either form pedunculated lesions or iris atrophy with, um, with uh, keratopia and polychoria, as is seen in this uh, particular patient. So it's uh, the pathology in all in the eye syndrome patients, again, is an abnormal corneal um, here is the cornea, here is the iris. Um, so there is an, uh, the corneal endothelium is abnormal and what it's doing is to spread right across the, it's growing, instead of stopping at the Schwalbe's line, it's growing across and uh, spreading onto the iris. And in the process, it's gonna pull the iris when it contracts, causing per high peripheral cynical adhesions closing the angle and increasing the likelihood of developing glaucoma, which is seen in almost greater than 50% of these patients. And uh, contraction of the iris causes the changes that we described. So depending upon which disease is much more prominent, which uh, future is much more prominent, you divide that into these uh, three distinct entities. Um, uh, Okay, let's move on to nanophthalmos. Um, the, by definition, nanophthalmos is in a, a small eyeball measuring le less than 19 millimeters um, in the axial uh, length um, with a normal size lens because of which you will end up with a very shallow anterior chamber, angle crowding. Um, there you typically have hypermetropia, thick sclera, and may have may present with uveal effusions um, post surgery. So got to be very careful in this particular patient. Here is a patient the, um, in my own practice uh, with nanophthalmos, as you can see in the excellent measurements here. Our excellent measurements were 18.25 millimeters in the right eye and 18.17, 18.17 millimeters in the left eye. Um, she was hyper open, measured 45 di diopters. And required a 45 diopters in trochal lens um, uh, to correct her hyperopia completely. Um, I treated this, uh, this lady presented with uh, gradually creeping in you know, elevated in pressures and, um, and angle closure. I treated her with like, a simple cataract extraction um, uh, and goniosyniculysis, following which the angle opened up. Um, and uh, her intraocular pressures are controlled uh, with topical medications. Um, and she has done well uh, in the last few years that have been um, following her. Uh, um, now, the uveal effusion um, that has been described in association with this particular syndrome um, is more likely to happen if you uh, do a cataract extraction using the old-fashioned extracapsular cataract extraction or if you do a trabeculectomy operation to control the intraocular pressure, you gotta be really careful and be worried about the uveal effusion. And so um, this is one of the two diseases where prophylactic sclerotomy is advised, uh, the other disease being the Strudge Weber syndrome. So nanophthalmos and Strudge Weber syndrome are the two indications for prophylactic sclerotomy to avoid uveal effusions following glaucoma surgery. Fuchs syndrome is associated with heterochromia, cataract, glaucoma. It's almost it's uh, unilateral, um, almost always. Fine angle blood vessels in the are seen, and this may bleed when you uh, decompress the eye, such as when you enter the anterior chamber in the, uh, for cataract surgery. Let's say you can see bleeding in the opposite angle, and associated with arterocyclitis uh, that is not responsive to steroids. 
glucometo-cyclitic crisis, um, uh, typically seen in Middle East and uh, patients and of unknown etiology. Some people believe this is secondary to HSV. Um, almost always unilateral again, um, just like fugues, but uh, bilateral cases of glycopatocyclotic crisis have been described. Typically, the patient presents with intraocular pressures between 30 and 50 millimeters of mercury, secondary to trabeculitis. Um, the clinical presentation would include mild conjunctival injection, which could be mistaken for a pink eye, corneal, mild corneal edema, which would decrease the intraocular pressure, I mean, decrease the vision by two lines, um, and examination of the antechamber would relieve uh, reveal um, uh, one plus cells, uh, have one plus flare, and a few KPs, usually in the inferior half of the cornea in the middle. The response to steroids and to glaucoma, um, uh, topical and oral glaucoma medications. Um, frequent attacks, however, may result in permanent intra elevation of the intraocular pressure and may require surgical intervention. Trisomy 13 uh, to 15, um, all of which may be associated with uh, glaucoma. Um, uh, infantile glaucoma, they also have a variety of other systemic problems, including microcephaly, uh, um, heart and kidney defects, and uh, cleft lip. And facial asymmetry, as is seen in this particular patient. Um, uh, broad thumb syndrome, um, again, infantile glaucoma, Broad thumb and great toe is associated with mental retardation. Hellerman Strife syndrome is associated with micro ophthalmos, cataract, malformed facial bones, and defective hair growth. Um, pretty classic when you see a patient. The Love syndrome is a favorite um, uh, uh, question. Uh, that they like to ask in your OCAPs and your boards. Um, the symptoms develop due to lack of enzyme, uh, which is uh, listed here. Um, it's uh, secondary, um, secondary to hyperaminoaciduria, uh, leads to mental, mental retardation, cataract formation, microphagia, and infantile glaucoma. Rubella syndrome, um, is, um, is associated with infection in the first trimester um, of pregnancy. Um, it's associated with angle abnormalities uh, leading to congenital glaucoma, um, congenital cataracts, which is much more common than congenital glaucoma. Um, both can occur in the same patient. Um, um, they, they also may have corneal opacities, um, microphthalmia, um, and remember, the cataracts are infected with the virus. And so when you do cataract extraction, make sure that the entire um, contents of the cataract um, is, uh, is taken out. If you leave the cortical material behind, the patient may develop a reporting inflammation because of uh, uh, the viral load uh, escaping into the eye. Here is a uh, patient of mine that that I've taken care of. You can see a patient has microphthalmia um, and, um, uh, and had cataract surgeries in both eyes and congenital glaucoma as well. Enardia, another favorite topic um, from the exam point of view. Uh, uh, it's mutation of the PAX6 gene. Um, named for its paired box status on band 13 of short arm chromosome 11. Um, it's uh, familial um, in nature, autosomal dominant in two thirds of the cases, uh, sporadic in nature in 20% of the cases. Um, uh, among, the sporadic, among the sporadic cases, 20% are associated with WT1 region um, uh, adjacent to the A, N2 and area region causing Wilms tumor. So 20% of the sporadic cases may be associated with um, Wilms tumor. That's the take home message here, a very important take home message. Um, so you need to screen these patients and two thirds of these patients are of autosomal dominant inheritance pattern related to the PAX gene defect. 
Now, there are a couple of syndromes associated with anorexia um, that they like to ask you, test you on. Jalopsy syndrome, which is to uh, seen in 2% of the cases, it's autosomal recessive disorder and associated with cerebellar ataxia, mental retardation, and anorexia. The WAGR syndrome, which is autosomal dominant disorder, um, seen in 30% of the cases. Um, the WAGR stands for Wilms tumor, anorexia, genital urinary anomalies, and mental retardation. So in conclusion, anorexia is associated with uh, Wilms tumor in 20% of the, the cases uh, in the sporadic group. Um, as far as the eye is concerned, uh, these patients from uh, anterior segment to the posterior segment, um, they have lack of limbal stem cells because of which they can present to you with panis as the as the child as the patient ages. So by the time the 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 patient is like 20 to 30 years of age, you can develop diffuse corneal opacities because of this panis formation. Two, they can have angle abnormalities leading to glaucoma. Um, uh, and uh, usually this is seen in um, between 10 and 20 years of age um, in, in teens because of retraction of the iris stump towards the angle, trabecular meshwork, closing the trabecular meshwork, causing glaucoma. Three, they can develop cataracts. And the four, these patients have uh, macular hypoplasia because of which they're associated with pendular nystagmus. And uh, as you can see here, there's no macular reflex that is uh, clearly visible. Um, and so in earlier patients, to summarize, um, have lack of limbal stem cells leading to cornea panis, two angle abnormalities that can present to you as a delayed glaucoma, three cataract form formation that may need cataract surgery for macular hypoplasia, secondary to which they will develop a pendular nystagmus and amblyopia. So like I mentioned before, the glaucoma in an area is secondary to angle closure from iris stump retraction and blockage of the trabecular meshwork. It's typically seen in the first and second decade of life. Uh, prophylactic goniotomy if you observe these patients in a um, serial fashion and you notice that the retraction of the iris stumps is taking place, David Walton from Boston, one of my mentors, um, suggested that prophylactic goniotomy at that stage might prevent these patients from um, developing glaucoma. If they do develop glaucoma in spite of um, um, your efforts or the patient already has glaucoma by the time you see the patient, um, then uh, a glaucoma drainage device implantation um, is the treatment. Will Marchesani syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder associated with this ADAMTS10 gene mutation. Um, Autosomal recessive, um, uh, some patients are autosomal recessive and the, they are associated with this FB1N1 gene mutation. Uh, they're associated clinically with microspherophagia, um, which is how the patient typically is seen um, in the eye clinic. Bra brachydactyly short stature, myopia, inferior, inferiorly displaced lenses as opposed to morphins where you see that the lens is superiorly displaced and pupillary block leading to glaucoma secondary to microspherophagia. So they have a micro small round lens that can cause pupillary block glaucoma. The lens can get displaced inferiorly. Uh, they're associated with increasing myopia and infantile glaucoma. So from the point of view of um, uh, exams, the, and also if you ever were to be involved in the care of these patients, remember airway management during anesthesia can be difficult because of stiff joints, poorly aligned teeth, and maxillary hypoplasia. Ophthalmic myotics and midriotics should be avoided because they can induce pupillary block in an eye with microspherophagia. The treatment obviously is
is extraction um, and trabecolectomy. Um, the lens extraction in this patient population is kind of tricky. And um, if you don't have the experience to deal with this kind of lenses, it's best to refer the patient to um, someone with uh, experience to deal with this particular kind of uh, cataracts. Marfan syndrome, another favorite and um, one of our most famous uh, presidents had Marfan's um, syndrome, um, Abraham Lincoln. It's an autosomal dominant disorder. It's carried by um, FBN1 gene that encodes fibrillin 1, uh, which is a connective tissue protein. Now, fibrillin normally binds to TGF beta. Uh, abnormal fibrillin leads to excess TGA beta, which in turn leads to damage to the lung, heart valves, and iota, leading to this um, uh, disorder that we call as Marfan syndrome. Now, it affects a wide variety of uh, systemic um, uh, systems in the body, including the eyes, lungs, where it can cause pneumothorax. In the cardiovascular system, it can cause aortic dilation, aneurysms, mitral valve prolapse, uh, skeletal system is affected too, including scoliosis, pectus deformities, tall stature, loose joints, etc. Here is an example um, of how these patients uh, look. From the eye point of view, um, these patients have uh, ectopia lentis, 80% of the, uh, in 80% of the patients, um, usually the lens is displaced up and out, um, as opposed to Will Marchesani, which is down and in. Um, they are associated with high myopia, increased risk of retinal detachment, open angle glaucoma, and uh, skeletal abnormalities, as we discussed previously. Let's move on to phacomatosis, um, which is part glaucoma. This is another hot topic that they frequently ask in your OCAPs or boards. Uh, these are neurocutaneous syndromes. Um, they affect, uh, affect uh, affected tissues sort of common ectodermal origin. And typically, it affects the C Now, so the Strach Weber syndrome um, or the en encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis is associated with the um, unilateral port vein stains of the face, glaucoma, seizures, mental retardation, and ipsilateral leptomeningeal angioma. Um, so, typically, they have um, a cavernous angioma of the face, as is seen here. Um, they have um, um, angioma of the choroid in the eye, and they have leptomeningeal angioma all on the same side. Um, it's caused by an AV malformation that occurs in the cerebrum of the brain on the same side as the physical signs described above. Normally, only one side of the head is affected. Um, it is an embryonal developmental anomaly resulting from errors in mesodermal and ectodermal development, okay? Unlike other neurocutaneous disorders, um, Strach Weber syndrome does not have a hereditary tendency, but occurs in a spor sporadic fashion. Remember this, and they do ask you this Strach Weber does not have any hereditary tendency. So, from the clinical point of view, these patients uh, develop say, present with seizures that begin in infancy. They uh, exhibit development of delays, mental retardation. In 50% of the patients, uh, they have glaucoma, which can present at birth or develop later. If it presents at birth, these patients can develop ophthalmos. Um, it, um, um, and uh, here is an example of how the eye looks. As you can see, there's a portrait stain of the lid. Um, um, you can see dilated conjunctival blood vessels, and you can see um, uh, cherry red appearance of the, of the uh, retina because of the cordial, uh, cordial angioma. 
treatment uh, in Stretch Weber's uh, syndrome related glaucoma. You want to try glaucoma medications initially. If that doesn't um, uh, control it, you may want to go for surgery, but with extreme caution, um, avoid surgery to the extent possible. Um, again, like I mentioned before, um, nanophthalmus and Stretch Weber syndrome are both afflicted with the uveal effusion syndromes, um, uh, uveal effusion soon after glaucoma surgery. And so you know, as a prophylaxis, you may want to um, perform scleral windows uh, or sclerotomies um, or recommended uh, to prevent this uveal effusions. Or the, the, the pathology behind this is pretty interesting. In nanophthalmus, it's a thick sclera that prevents the, the uveal fluid from escaping transscleral fashion, whereas in uh, Strudge Weber, I'm assuming that it's the leaky blood vessels that um, leak out so much of this um, fluid into the uh, into the supercoral space that the system is overwhelmed and uh, you'll end up with massive uveal effusions. Neurofibromatosis is a autosomal dominant disorder. Um, it's the most common of all the phacomatosis. Um, it's, this disorder affects all neural cross cells, including the Schwann cells, the melanocytes, endo, endoneural fibroblast, um, and consequently you can have a wide variety of um, CNS um, tumors seen in this disorder. The neurofibromatosis is of two kinds, type one and type two. Um, the type 1 is the peripheral neurofibromatosis of von reckling hansen disease. This is the most common variety uh, seen in 1 in uh, 3,000 to 5,000 patient population. It's autosomal dominant or sporadic in nature. The defect is in band 11 of the long arm of chromosome 17. So what are the ocular findings in neurofibromatosis type 1, ectropia, and UVA? Um, if you see a, uh, in, an infant with ectropia and UVA, you need to screen this baby for neurofibromatosis. Leash nodules, optic nerve glioma, eyelid neurofibroma, fibroma, and glaucoma, especially if the patient has uh, eyelid Upper eyelid neurofibroma, you need to, um, a lot of those patients with that upper eyelid neurofibroma do develop glaucoma, so you need to screen them or watch them for that. Now, sometimes uh, the neurofibromatosis type 1 is combined uh, with Proteus syndrome. Elephant man is an outstanding example of this combination. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know about the elephant man, he was, um, um, born in London um, in, in, uh, and during the Victorian era. And because his diagnosis was, uh, he was not diagnosed in those days um, properly, um, he was uh, treated like a uh, circus animal, unfortunately, and exhibited in the London uh, circus. Um, it's, uh, these patients have overgrowth of skin, bone, muscle, fat, blood vessels, and lymphatics. Uh, this is a picture uh, from Wikipedia of uh, this elephant man, and you can see the deformities of the skeleton. future that is associated with this bilateral acoustic neuromas. In fact, the hallmark of um, and, um, neurofibromatosis type 2 is hearing loss due to acoustic neuromas around the age of 20, associated with multiple other nervous system tumors. As far as the eye is concerned, these patients do not exhibit glaucoma. The only ocular finding that type 2 has is PSE cataract, or posterior subcapsular cataract formation. There are a host of other pediatric glaucomas, um, uh, conditions that are associated with intraocular tumors or retinopathy of prematurity. Um, the ROP um, glaucoma is because of angle closure glaucoma. And just to complete the discussion here, um, I would encourage you to read um, um, Jan Legrand's uh, new version of the uh, new edition textbook if you want um, to gather more information on these pediatric glaucoma syndromes. 
So the treatment for infantile glaucoma, just like adult glaucoma, will include medications, lasers, and surgery, depending upon the condition. Um, in majority of these patients, you want to try medications if it's not effective um, or poorly controlled, and then you want to go for surgical intervention. But every time you do surgery in infantile um, uh, glaucoma patients, you got to be really careful. I will leave you with uh, uh, a reference paper from my mentor, David Walton from uh, Boston. Um, a great review that's published in 2005 in the Journal of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, Newborn Primary Congenital Glaucoma, um, gives you a great summary of the disease process. As always, a thank you for uh, listening to this lecture, and uh, please look out for more lectures on Meditrad YouTube website, and look out for our CME, upcoming CME and board review courses. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, contact me at il at meditrad.com or directly at um, rel at tulane.edu.